Nice. Welcome everyone to another community call research hub. And today we have a few items on the agenda, starting with the feature roadmap review. It's my understanding that uh, so users are interested what, what bugs are a priority, what features are a priority, and is there any convenient way to you know take a look at the uh, the priority list, so to say? What would be the best way to interact with the team here, Patrick? So I think what we should do for new uh, features is use a GitHub discussion. Uh, Kobe had set it up. Kobe, do you mind kind of like walking through? I think we should use this uh, later in this call too for um, the peer review discussion. But but in general, just to help, uh, I guess like centralize some of some of these talks because they're they're kind of in the Slack channel now, and then also in the Research Hub hub. Just to to put them all in one place, I think the GitHub discussion uh, form is probably the best venue. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We recently open sourced uh, our repos, and we're trying to leverage the discussions feature on on GitHub um, because just to give you guys all context, the reason why we want to do it is because um, us developers are sometimes removed from the conversations that lead to uh, features being developed, and it's really nice to be able to reference like a conversation so that uh, the developers can actually have context and build the feature the right way. Um, so maybe I do a little bit, uh, Anton, if you don't mind, I'll do a little bit of screen share. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, can you all see my screen? Yep. Yeah, so we have, um, these are all the repos that we have. We have a bunch of them. Uh, Research Hub Web, is where we're trying to streamline all conversations. Um, unfortunately, there is no like easy way to do it. Ideally, uh, GitHub would have like a discussion feature on the organization itself, but it doesn't have that. So um, Research Hub Web is the best place to do it. And so like if you go here and you click on discussions, um, you know, we just kicked it off last week. You can see there is like a bunch of discussions here. Um, on the left, there is like categories. So you have like bugs, um, ideas and requests, uh, open source bounties, which are like uh, bounties that we will pay in RSC for some open source development uh, contributions and Q&A, which is like, could be anything. Um, so we're playing around with it. Um, you can see here, for the brainstorm for peer review, um, there is like a lot of stuff I added here um, and we can go over it at the end, but I just wanna emphasize that not every feature request needs to be this detailed. It can even be like one sentence. Uh, the reason why I put it all here is because like the, I've thought about it and I wanted to put all my thoughts in one place. Um, so yeah, let me pause here. Does that make sense? So you guys have any questions about that? Um, okay, cool. So I imagine that makes sense. And just to give you a context, so like, let's say in GitHub, uh, there is this notion of pull request, which is like where we have code and, and it just makes it so nice. Like GitHub makes it really nice to reference like a particular discussion. It all comes together. And, uh, one of the things we want to do next, there is, uh, GitHub is a project. Uh, feature that's not, I didn't enable it yet, but um, I think we lost Kobe. No. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm curious, do you all think we should just pin that repo in the editor channel or the community channel and just yeah. add people to it temporarily? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can do that right after this call. And do you think it makes sense to do it on GitHub rather than through the Research Hub forum or via Slack? This is mostly for the engineers to help organize uh, the feedback. It's kind of like a pain in our butts to make it easier for them in theory. It's probably easier for engineers to be doing GitHub, right? Yeah, way easier. And to put like all the context and like the use cases of why features like want to be in theory developed. Cool. Yeah. So I can definitely do that right after this call. Um, 
Anton, do you know what was next on the agenda? We can do that while we wait for Kobe. Uh, I think the next one is also Kobe. Is a trend in hot score feedback? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I so I lost you guys. Uh, were you guys were you able to hear anything I said? We lost like, the last like two minutes, maybe. Mm -hmm. Ah, two minutes. Bummer. Ah, okay. Can, do you guys, uh, where did you, where, where did I drop off? Kind of like walking through the discussion forum. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a bummer, but it's okay. I guess it happens. Uh, do you want to do the, the feature roadmap stuff? Yeah, I think that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know what's going on like uh, with my internet. Maybe I turn off my camera. I've been having like, intermittent like internet failures today i i've been kind of going crazy trying to debug this but uh yeah hopefully i won't drop off <clears throat> can you guys see my screen mm -hmm. Good. yeah <clears throat> yeah so like uh the discussions feature so you heard me um there was like one other thing i wanted to point out which is we have this uh engineering task list which is a notion board uh, GitHub also has a feature like this, and we're going to probably migrate uh, this feature into GitHub for more visibility. Um, yeah, so anyways, uh, let's go over some roadmap stuff. So before I share the roadmap with you, uh, I want to go over some like high level goals. So uh, yeah, just to give people more context. So can you, you guys can see it, right? I'm going to like ask you uh, for things just because like I might drop off. You guys can see things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I can see, I can't see anyone. So, all right. So the high level goals that we have for 2022 and they're subject to change because, you know, we're a startup at the very, uh, I guess, like uh, cut, cutting edge um, industry and things change like sometimes from week to week. So. So far, uh, high level goals are one, identify product market fit through continuous exploration. So that means um, really figuring out where does research hub fit within the scientific community? Uh, wh where, is, where is our place? Um, uh, two, identify a revenue generation model. So we, we still need to generate income in order to uh, keep operations going. That's a, a very important topic for us. Uh, identify a DAO structure that fits Research Hub. So right now, you know, we're exploring different models and uh, I think we're on, like, identified some good stuff here, but hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have something more concrete. Um, increase our weekly active contributor. So it's kind of a KPI slash goal. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, we have uh, very few weekly active contributors and we want to make that, like, about 10 times uh, higher. Um, grow our developer community. So without, at the moment, we're a very small team and we just need a lot more resources. So that's why we open source our repos and started this bounty program because we want to uh, attract more developers and more hands to help us uh, build a good product. Um, yeah, and continue to build an economy around research coin. So right now research coin, it's like it's a, at its infancy but uh, we want to experiment with different models and to actually create an economy where research coin makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so let me pause here and Joyce, if you have anything more to add, please free, feel free to. No, I think that's great, Kobe. Thanks for putting this all together. It would be interesting to see like uh, what people think of these goals and generally um, when we zoom into how we're going to achieve them if everybody thinks we're kind of like on the right track planning wise. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about any one of these topics? Um, please feel free to, to share. I think uh, it's very helpful to hear what uh, other community members have to, to say. Uh, hi, Kobe. Uh, regarding our, uh, regarding trying to look for a revenue generation model, uh, are we just trying to, are we experimenting with a lot of stuff right now or are we just waiting for something to strike us? I mean, what progress are we doing? In that? Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. So, 
we we are like we've not experimented with anything yet we've only experimented in uh brainstorm so what we have uh come up with so far is a couple of things so thing number one has to do with our um the new upcoming feature uh, of uh, electronic lab notebook so it will be the basic electronic lab notebook will be available to everyone that's at least our our thinking right now but maybe certain um high certain like uh specific features like for example like uh integration with jupiter hub and things like that may in incur additional cost so that's one model um the other model that we have been thinking about is uh fundraising so we want to one of the goals of research hub is to um, kind of disrupt and uh, fix a lot of the uh, fundraising problems in science and we are thinking about doing that through um, crowdfunding <clears throat> and uh, NFT minting. Um, and the thinking behind it is that we can, uh, Research Hub can um, charge a specific percentage uh, through the these fundraising cam campaigns. These are like uh, not new models, they exist at the moment. Um, and we're thinking about like uh, stuff like that, yeah. I think to add to that too, uh, one model we've tried but don't love potentially long term is having like a percent of uh, tips through Research Hub flow back mm -hmm. into the DAO. So this is something where like, yeah, essentially every transaction you make via the supporting feature, a certain percentage could flow back into the DAO's revenue. It'd be pretty easy for us to uh, enact something like this, but we don't love it because it doesn't seem like it's really going to make a like huge dent in our mission of accelerating science. Like it, it could be a nice way to start to generate like a little bit of revenue, but at the end of the day, taking like a tip on or a fee on tips doesn't feel that impactful compared to um, like trying to help collaboration to the ELN or trying to make uh, funding uh, basically like uh, easier to uh, get for the average scientist and also more efficient for funders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts about any of these topics before we move on to some like in the weeds? Uh, yeah. Also, uh, thank you for that answer. And also about product market fit. Uh, do we have any specifics that we're trying to, any specific KPIs, for example, that we're trying to meet that would signal that we're reaching product market fit? So there's like a lot of theorizing around product market fit. If you follow like startup Twitter, um, a, a lot of times people say like, it's like, you know, this is the worst analogy ever, but it's like pornography. Like, you know, it when you see it and it's hard to describe otherwise, right? Like the, the Supreme Court ruling. Um, what I've heard with product market fit is basically like, and this is like the description that I like the most, but it's like, your entire team wants to quit because they're overworked and there's too much happening. And then also on top of that, there are like community members showing up to your offices with tattoos of your company's logo. So it's like just overwhelming demand for the product where it's like, you know, we're out of our bandwidth for the current team size. And then also like a, like a kind of euphoria among community members. Um, so, so this is, you know, clearly a, a broad definition that doesn't really mean all that much, but it's it's like one of those situations. <laughs> that's hilarious. It's it's one of those situations where it's like it will be very obvious once we have it. But it, if it doesn't feel like we have it, then we probably don't. Um, with that being said, though, uh, the the video that like somebody just randomly made, maybe they're on this community call. I don't even know if they are. Thank you so much. I think it was really cool. <laughs> But, but that's kind of like a, a little, like maybe that's like one tenth of a, of a tattoo, like showing up at our office, like somebody's, you know, taking their own free time and making a YouTube video to help promote Research Hub. And, and I thought it was pretty good. Like it was solid for just somebody in their free time making a video. So I, I think we're on the right track, but yeah, I haven't started pulling my hair out yet. So a little bit more to go, I think. Um, yeah. Um... Was there any questions? Were there any questions in the chat? Uh, I can't see the chat. Mao, look at the hand. Oh yeah, feel free to ask, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, regarding, um, you know, like the revenue generation, uh, like just a few minutes ago, I think Obi, you mentioned about the 
peer review part. So um, is that going to be down the line something that would help Research Hub, right? Like, I mean, you know, right now, I mean, I know our goal is open access, but um, if, if at all this becomes like a publication platform, which is one of our goals, like, and people submit manuscripts, um, then do we charge and does that help Research Hub? Yeah, so, so this is a great suggestion. Um, there's been a lot of talk because of the tweet from Nature Neuroscience where they say, you know, their article processing charge is $11,000. Like, a lot of people have been pretty upset about that. So I think there is a potential business model within a peer review feature for us where maybe, like, we have some kind of more reasonable APC where the like actual value there funds to the peer reviewers rather than like to the company behind like the peer review organization. And then also any additional revenue could flow back into the DAO. I think this is compelling because as a researcher, you'd be paying an APC to yourself in theory as you earn research coins um, and like mm -hmm. earning like uh, governance rights over that revenue. And then uh, yeah, having peer reviewers actually be paid for their expertise, I think, is very compelling and would make a lot more sense from researchers who want to publish to know that, like, their money is actually going towards value instead of, like, volunteer work where a C-Corp somewhere is generating, like, lots and lots of revenue from it. So I, I think there's something there. It's not my favorite because APCs generally just make my skin crawl. So, like, I think I think we could do better. But there, there is something there that I think could potentially be valuable and help us start to generate some revenue. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and one more question. This is like from prior about the GitHub part. I was just trying to make sure. So like you guys are saying, so if, if there is some problem or something, um, instead of Slacks, we put it on GitHub. Is that what I understand correctly? So bug um, are perfect for Slack. And, and this would be like new feature requests. So, so rather something breaking Slack because mm -hmm. that, that needs our attention immediately. But this is for like, if you want something new in research hub that doesn't exist yet, that that's where GitHub would be the appropriate venue. Okay. Yeah. And Thanks. by the way, I, I know it's a bit confusing because I have bugs here, but uh, this is mainly for kind of people outside of the community that are using open source and in the future, like uh, I'm thinking there may be a class of people that will not be slacking us about these bugs. So the more avenues for bug reporting, the better, but Slack is certainly the preferred channel. Sounds good, thanks. Cool, um, yeah, thank you for these, uh, these questions. So now let's talk about, let's get a little bit in the weeds and talk about the roadmap. As you can see, it's a bit, um, I guess, uh, what's the word, uh, empty when it comes to Q2 and beyond. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, we're like in a very uh, cutting edge field and we're trying a lot of different things and who knows what Q2 will really look like. Definitely Q3 and Q4. I could put some stuff up there, but they would likely within 90% confidence uh, change. So I figured we'll focus on Q1 and a little bit of Q2. Um, so for Q1, uh, we open sourced our repos. Uh, we launched the editor program. We improved our notifications. Um, <clears throat> we iterated on our author profile page. And so now there is like a feed instead of like, kind of like a snapshot of uh, things. And um, there is a bunch of th things we've done, but I'm not gonna bore you with the details. Uh, what, some of the things we are currently working on slash yet to work on are uh, revamping our paper upload feature. We hear you, we know it sucks. Um, it was created a while back and like, trust us, it's definitely the number one thing that we're trying to tackle. So it will be fixed and uh, we're, just to give you a little bit more insight, it will be much uh, simpler in the sense that when you uh, kick off the paper upload flow, there'll be just one field, which will be like either give us a link to a paper or a DOI or upload a file kind of thing, but only like one field and then we'll um, kick things off and do things behind the scenes and uh, upload the paper. Um, so yeah, we have des designs for it and we're going to start working on it this week. 
Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, as I mentioned, fundraising will start things off uh, this quarter and will likely not finish until Q2. We will begin things with NFTs. We have not yet done an official brainstorming. Uh, I will kick things off on GitHub and I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts because this is like the beginning of revenue generation for Research Hub and also the beginning of something really cool for the scientific community. Uh, our initial thoughts are like basically um, at the time of publication on Research Hub, um, you'll be able to mint an NFT. Um, not sure what that NFT may look like. It could be like an NFT representing your paper or an NFT representing a figure. Uh, that NFT can be purchased by someone via an auction. And in the future, things like uh, intellectual property profits, I mean, profits from intellectual property, like if it's like pharmaceutical or something like that can be shared with the owner of an NFT. Does, are we gonna go into open edition NFTs? Um, minting of tokens, not sure yet, uh, more of that to come. Um, so that's that. Uh, feed, we're gonna improve our feed. I'm working on that at the moment, showing more relevant results. As you see, like feed is, it was good up until a certain point, but a lot of the things that we have were created a while back and they made sense, but now is the time to uh, improve on them. The feed is one of those things. Um, ELN plus publishing features. Thomas gave a nice demo on what that looks like. Um, so that's going to go live like early slash mid next week. Um, and what that would do is essentially replace the post feature with a more um, like robust publication feature. And um, the thinking, one of the things Joyce has been working on is uh, being able to have research out be a DOI. And I guess it's called a DOI creator so that uh, if you choose in certain cases, um, publish content, that content is gonna be assigned a DOI. Uh, so we want to really compete with like uh, other publication avenues and make research out the publication platform. Um, yeah, we want to lock down publication params. So right now at Research Hub, you can publish anything. And we experimented by keeping things open. And that made sense. But right now we're, we don't want to become like a Reddit. Um, we don't want to become like just another site on the web um, that already exists. We want to narrow down our focus on like what, what is Research, research Hub's value. Um, so we want to lock down publication params, implement these parameters into um, the notebook feature and into our um, kind of guidelines. Um, <clears throat> iterate on our incentive structure, token incentives. Um, like right now, the incentives that incentivizes um, upvoting has been created a while back, but it's due for an upgrade. So we're going to tackle that um, this quarter and we're going to kick off uh, the peer review process. Um, we want to, this is something we're really excited about. Uh, we think it has a lot of potential and we want it, we want to do it in such a way where uh, the peer reviewer and the author would get rewarded for a review so that, you know, authors also feel compelled to publish because they will get rewarded uh, with RC for their publication. Um, so yeah, that's for Q1. I'm going to quickly cover Q2 and then I'm going to pause. <clears throat> so for Q2, um, it's looking a bit uh, empty here, but we're going to improve on our ELN features by likely integrating with Jupyter Notebook. Um, so that you can run code directly in our ELN. We're going to improve our fundraising tools. <clears throat> so we really like uh, Mirror. I'm not sure if you heard of Mirror, but they're like a publication website for, I guess, anything. Like if you're like an author, like a Substack type uh, thing where you can publish content. And 
you can do things like uh, mint NFT in auctions, or you can um, crowdfund via token creation, and you can do something called splitting, which is pretty cool, where you can say uh, define exact rules for sending profits to different locations. So like imagine if you're auctioning an NFT and uh, you you can set param saying like, if this NFT is purchased, I want 10% of the proceeds, uh, proceeds to go here and 10% to go there and 80% to me. And you can programmatically do this and that goes on the blockchain. Um, and that's pretty cool. We were going to build on the editor program. Um, we thought it was very successful um, and we're at the infancy of that program and we want to like uh, improve on it. Um, so yeah, let me pause here. Uh, any questions, any thoughts? I think just to add a tiny bit more context to this too, some, some of these features like the fundraising feature and peer review, like they probably require a quarter of full attention. So um, one of the things that we could use your help from here is helping us to prioritize which ones to address first. Um, in our minds, kind of the, the long-term flow is getting publishing on Research Hub. So that way people can share new publications, basically preprints with DOIs. After that, peer review. So that way these preprints can uh, be openly peer reviewed and eventually, you know, gain like a peer reviewed publication status on Research Hub. And then once that's happening, we think it makes sense to get into funding because if you have authors who are sharing novel content and doing peer review, there's actually a large pool of like kind of interesting scientists that funders would um, want to, I guess, interact with and help like provide support for their work. So in, in our minds, the strategy makes sense of doing publications, peer review, and then funding um, basically in order to have enough content and people around that are interesting for the funders by the time we get there. Does that make like a, a sense as order of operations for everybody? Do you think we might uh, have things kind of out of order potentially? Uh, I guess Patrick, like with the Jupiter, is the like I'm guessing it's at the top of the list because it's the number one priority for Q2, or do you, is that no. is that kind of depending on? Okay, yeah. it's something Thomas is very excited about. The engineer who's been working on the ELN, so he he personally is passionate about it and wants to build it into the ELN. So that's why uh, we have it like pretty near the top. I, I know that Anton has a question about this too. Anton, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I guess. I'm um, sorry. Um, is my audio okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm also excited about the Jupyter Notebook and, and the ELN because I think the one thing is uh, the whole uh, revenue pipeline and uh, doing the incentives with crypto, but I also think that it's really important to have some value in publishing through the website. And um, so the question was kind of like, do we already know are the like the notebooks are they going to run locally on the devices of the people or in a cloud service? Um, do we like what's like the purpose of like the notebook right now? Um, is it like for demo purpose so that we could like make a blog post where there's sometimes little code snippets where we can load, or is it like is there like further ideas for like proper papers using them and like a new ways of publications like hugging face integrations like where you can click and run a model or some computation automatically? Yeah, uh, very good question. So the notebook will not run locally. It's a web-based notebook and it will be very similar. I'm not sure if you use Notion, but um, in Notion, if you create, if you can see my screen and you can create like a, uh, uh, yeah, let's look at like, I don't know, like any document that you create essentially um, gives you very basic, uh, publication features like you know bolding headers etc so that's what our notebook is going to allow it's just going to be make it a little bit easier and digestible to publish content uh, via the web you could also work locally let's say in word or whatever uh, tool of your choice and then when you're ready you can come to research hub and copy and paste that content into the ELN, um, that's another alternative way. 
in regards to the Jupyter notebook, um, it's since it's web-based, you will run the uh, code and stuff like that, similar to Google's Code Lab directly in the web. Um, understand that it might not fit all cases, but the intention of it is to um, give, um, make the publications as good as it can be. So if it means running code uh, for the sake of publication, you can do that, or you can even like run the code locally, take a screenshot of the output, put it into the ELN. That's another way of doing it. Um, yeah, we're still experimenting, but that's kind of like the high level thoughts. Yeah, that sounds great. So like right now it seems like the, as a researcher, the incentive would be that I can, when I write a paper or I want to write a blog post additional to the paper or just a blog post, I can use the ELN in like the midterm future for exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Anton, if you have more feedback too, I can connect you with Thomas, who's the developer leading the ELN. And I'm sure a lot of these thoughts, um, he, he'd have, you know, uh, more more color to share and then also be able to incorporate your feedback. So I'll, I'll connect you guys. He's, he's on vacation for this week, but once he gets back, I'll put him in touch. Yeah, sure. Sounds great. Satvik had a hand. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry if this is coming from my lack of research experience, but uh, isn't there some sort of notion API or any, any other integration that we can do instead of building our own notebook? Yeah, we can. So notion is like a preliminary API and it's something we looked into because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and it's something we considered. The reason why we ended up building our own notion like solution is because um, in order to create like a really good user experience, unfortunately, um, you do need to reinvent the wheel sometimes. And that's one of those times because by having the notebook feature directly in Research Hub, we can build features on top of it in a way that Notion would not allow for. Um, and yeah, because like at the end of the day, like if you do use the Notion API, all the data is saved to Notion and then kind of like embedding that data back into Research Hub is not so easy. Um, and this was kind of like the, I guess the, the path of least resistance. All right. Uh, my suggestion here was uh, in the form that maybe we could do an MVP of those notebooks through a Notion integration. And then if the users and the community found it very useful, then we could build out the product instead of uh, instead of giving it a lot of mm. resources right out of the bat, right out the bat. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. I think um, any suggestion that involves like less uh, resources needing to be expended on our part is is really good. Um, so thank you. I appreciate it. I think uh, one of the things we have done that was uh, so much successful is that we shared um, early designs with the community about like how things should look and feel. And we thought that um, we're able to collect some really valuable feedback before implementation. So that was uh, quite, quite useful. Um, and yeah, so any ideas about how to save us some time would be always uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Another piece of this too, a topic, is that we believe the CLN is going to be kind of like the core product of Research Hub, like in two or three years, where Notion probably could start as an MVP, but we want to build like a ton of features on top of it specific for scientific publishing. And so um, in our minds, it's worthwhile to get something bespoke built in-house just because it's such an integral like piece of the product moving into the future that it, the assumption is that it's worthwhile to spend time building it out right so that way we'll be able to customize it appropriately. <clears throat> I guess Ricardo. Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things about uh, peer review and fundraising. So as for uh, peer review, I just wanted to ask if you uh, 
uh, consider any possible uh, conflict with like people that uh, would potentially like to also publish on uh, scientific journals. So are we going to be treated like uh, preprint so people will be allowed to uh, publish on research hub and then go publish on a on a journal or is is that going to create uh, any problem to the authors? And the second one uh, regarding the fundraising, I think someone uh, already raised this point a couple of calls ago. Uh, it could be cool to look into some potential grants. There's a lot of money being thrown at like uh, new technologies, like regards to like disruptive technologies uh, regarding like Web three and stuff like this. So it could potentially like be a good idea. I don't know in like uh, in the US, but I know for sure that in Europe there's a specific kind of like a uh, bunch of calls uh, like dedicated tailored for uh, these kind of uh, products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so these are great questions. Um, the first one I think is really important. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we believe that open science is kind of the future. And so we want any publication shared on Research Hub to be interoperable with the current academic publishing system. So if people wanted to share a preprint on Research Hub, but then eventually have that manuscript published in Nature, uh, we don't want to have like any legal restrictions that would potentially prevent that kind of in the same vein as bioarchive or med archive or archive taking like basically following their exact lead um we can offer a like range of licenses for people to publish under um i know bio, bio archive even has some that are like uh like essentially only allow bioarchive to uh like display the preprint I think ideally we'd want to kind of funnel people into like creative commons licenses that allowed for like unrestricted reuse and repurposing um but it, it it's possible that we could eventually um do something different if customer demand you know asked us to but but in general we want to follow the lead of other preprint servers that have made it very easy you know for a research hub to essentially display their content uh having it be open access as a default um, the second part of this question, potential grants for fundraising, I think that this is an awesome suggestion. Um, we've done a little bit of customer research in the past just to see if like uh, funders had potential appetite for this type of feature. Just as one example, um, the person who wrote Freakonomics, Dr. Stephen Levitt, uh, he works out of the University of Chicago and like has a nonprofit like trying to, I forget, it's like basically like technology, you know, like a, a techno utopian kind of like perspective where they want to fund projects that can help make the world a better place using technology. And so they actually were interested in running something through Research Hub um, to get together a group of like 10 like premier scientists who were working on developing some kind of like carbon capture technology and then trying to fund it like to the scale of like one to ten million dollars through Research Hub. So I think there are there is like significant demand from funders to try and like uh, experiment with new models for like helping to support scientific research. I think that like grants are definitely a great option. And once we get to the point mm -hmm. where we kind of have like an MVP for this, um, putting together like some community members to help spread the word to potential like grant givers, I think would be extremely helpful. So, so yeah, in, in response, we've done a little bit of market research. There does seem to be some demand in doing like cool, like, uh, like one-off projects through Research Hub, but I imagine that there would be more if we were to like put together a team of like salespeople per se to try and like reach out to these research funders. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Patrick. And I, I also wanted to add something on top, just because like after your answer, I thought about something else. Uh, as for the um, for the peer review, I think something that could really distinguish uh, like Research Hub from uh, let's say other. Uh, journals like in journals you normally have like a round of peer review or like three reviewers that give their opinion and then when it's published that's it uh something that we could have on research could be like uh say a continuous of uh review so like different rounds so like the paper after like uh, let's say a year gets a little bit let's say old or not updated and people can just update it with new data and make it like a living paper that could be really cool to add like you no know, give another additional value to what is done on uh, research Hub. Yeah, I think um, I totally agree. And that's uh, actually, I actually have one of the questions here. Should we, should we support periodical peer reviews as opposed to a single point in time? Um, I think that's what you're referring to, right? Is that like, a yeah. Basic, yeah, right? Okay. 
Yeah, I, it seems like logical to me. I think maybe every so often we should like um, make a paper eligible for peer review because like we want to kind of move away. There is a lot of like old science that was peer reviewed and maybe made sense back then. And uh, the outcome of that science are still like embodied in in doctors' uh, practices and stuff like that. And yeah, it makes total sense to be um, eligible for peer review. <clears throat> so this what do we want to talk about next? More peer review stuff or do you want to go into like the trending score? Uh, either works. We do need to leave a few moments for the code of conduct discussion. I think we could do like five minutes on that at the end. It's pretty simple. I just have like a few examples. Um, and, and I also think realistically we might need to do like a whole community call dedicated to peer review it seems like a, a pretty um you know big topic and making sure we get it right would be useful maybe, maybe over the next week um we can try and have people like add their thoughts into this discussion on github and then we'll have some content in order to like uh host a discussion next week where we can really dig into peer review for like half an hour or 45 minutes yeah, that would be fantastic. If you can take a look, add your thoughts. And um, just one more thing about uh, GitHub. It will be really helpful if you all created like a GitHub account, if you don't have one already. If you go to our repo and click this star button, um, this is actually, it seems uh, trivial, but it actually really helps us because it makes GitHub give more visibility into our project, which helps attract more eyes and developers. So if you don't mind doing so, they'll be greatly appreciated. Yeah, kind of kind of adding to that too. Um, like we have a core team at Research Hub, which is like uh, kind of like four and a half-ish developers, but we're really lucky in that like some open source engineers have also started to contribute code to our database. And so like a lot of the the small bugs that have been popping up, the more open source developers that we have in our community where we can just throw uh, bounties out, the faster we'll be able to actually like fix these things as they come up. So yeah, that like clicking on the GitHub star, it seems silly, but it actually does a lot when it comes to marketing for open source developers. And at the end of the day, it'll allow us to like fix bugs faster. So definitely worth the time. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, do we want to talk about this uh, trending score now or code of conduct? What do we want to do next? Let's do the trending score. It, it would be interesting. So a little bit of context here. Um, we had like a V1 of the trending score, which we haven't touched in a while. Um, and in theory, we'd like to improve it because we think that the home page doesn't accurately like reflect basically what's going on in the community. So we have sort of an initial idea of how we would like to implement like a V2 of this trending score. But it'd be interesting to hear like what the community wants us to prioritize in this score, whether like just as a couple examples, like we automatically will crawl Twitter to see if like people are talking about an article on Twitter and we have that, you know, weighted at a certain percentage. We have like discussion posts, like are people like discussing on Research Hub about this paper and then that goes into the algorithm weighted at a certain percentage. We have like native upvotes on Research Hub. So if you upvote it on Research Hub, how does that compare to like a retweet on Twitter um, within the algorithm? So we can do almost anything here. We could even do like page views or like PDF downloads. Um, so like lots of different, uh, you know, factors could go into this. So curious, yeah, what, what everybody thinks here should contribute to what ends up on the homepage. So for the Twitter score, how is that calculated? Like uh, who publishes, uh, like you just, uh, is the main account, the main research hub account that uh, pull some papers from from the uh, from the hubs and put it on Twitter. How does it work? Because I don't have a Twitter account for research hub. I want to make one, but uh, I don't have it still. Yeah. So the way it works is, uh, and it kind of goes into it ties back into uh, some of the bug reports that we had, which are not actually a bug. They're like <laughs> they're a feature, which is uh, a bit. It made sense back then, but maybe not so now. So what happens is when you upload a paper, we take the DOI of the paper, we crawl Twitter, we find like uh, mentions and upvotes and things like that in Twitter that reference the DOI or the paper, I'm not exactly sure. 
and then we um, we get like a, a number, like uh, the number of mentions. I think we add up the number of mentions and we um, put that number into our own native upvote score, which is not ideal. So basically, sometimes you'll see like a really highly voted paper, 96 or 100, and you're thinking to yourself, like, how did it get so many upvotes? It's because some of these upvotes actually come from this uh, Twitter score. So what we're thinking about is actually decoupling that score into like a social media score separate from the upvote. Um, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think that will totally make sense. Like, uh, especially when we're gonna when we we'll want to build our uh, social media presence, that will make uh, that will totally make sense. Yeah, to decouple it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the one thing that's very interesting to me as I'm thinking about it is that like content on Reddit. If you go to Reddit or if you go to Hacker News. A lot of the content that you see in the homepage is directly related to the time it was uploaded. So there is like a some log function that takes into account a bunch of things. And the time is the number one factor for like what shows up in the homepage. And Research Hub could be similar, but could be different. And I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts. So it could be similar in a sense that. If a paper is uploaded, we take into account into a factor like the published date or and the upload date. So maybe two, two factors of uh, time attributes. We calculate them into the score. So we could do that. However, the other side of this um, that I'm curious to hear your thoughts about is like one of the things we want to avoid um, happening on Research Hub is basically duplicates of uh, papers being uploaded because we want to maintain all discussions into um, in like one paper uh, thread. So like, let's say I upload a paper with a specific DOI and Patrick comes and uploads the same paper with a DOI, he's going to get an error saying like this paper already exists. Um, and with that being said, that kind of poses like an interesting dilemma about what should show up in the home page so imagine an old paper that was uploaded a while back but has maybe now recent comments should that show up in the home page should that be taken into account i'm not sure if anyone has any thoughts about that and whether that makes sense how, how smart is your algorithm like how how close to youtube is it right so maybe it could go to the to the top if the someone posted a recent comment but if nobody clicks on it anyway then maybe it stays there for uh, like a day or something and goes back to you know to, to the bottom yeah it's not very smart in that sense but it could be <laughs> so what you said anton makes sense like maybe we put some stuff up there and we take into account clicks as a factor. If no one clicks on it in a particular period of time, we lower the score by a certain percentage. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Like for it to be trending, there has to be, <clears throat> it can't just be based on like how new it is. It also has to be like based on engagement. Right, exactly. So but engagement Kobe, very important, yeah. Yeah, what's hard probably, Kobe, so it's probably why you did the Twitter thing, right? Because our, our network is not like large yet. So it's hard to like get natural organic engagement because like, you know, we're not like Reddit yet. So your your I guess your big question is like, how do you replace that while we build our network, eh? So for the Twitter score, our initial idea was to use Altmetric, which is this uh, Elsevier owned company that basically like uh, will crawl all social media for you and then gives like a score around that, basically like a popularity score. Um, it costs $30,000 a year to subscribe to this. So we figured like we'd be better off kind of um, like making a bespoke uh, like short-term solution until we could potentially afford that or hire engineers to make our own version. Um, so yeah, we, we wanted to do alt metric, but this is like kind of like, a, like an 80-20 solution to get a little bit of the way there at a much less cost. Yeah, so we just have a few more minutes. 
uh, before I know Patrick, I want to talk about the code of conduct. Any other thoughts about, I really like the, the fact that we take into account clicks. That's a very good idea. Are there any engagement metrics that we can use or maybe other things that you have in mind? Kobe, is it, is it, is there a possibility of, um, like you, the user affects like, like, you know, let's say like an editor, uh, engages in a lot of posts, like he has more say in his click or upvote than others. Is that like, is that a thing the system can do? So one, one thing we've wanted to do is to actually, uh, input each user's like scientific expertise. So like if you like had ever published a paper and you claim that paper, we could in theory say, hey, Joey, you know, has published in pharmacology before and now his upvote will be worth more than Joyce's who has never published in pharmacology. But, but Joyce has like a publication in molecular biology. So maybe Joyce's upvote is worth more in molecular biology than Joey's. Um, that's pretty, it's not a trivial thing to do. It's kind of complicated to like actually build that algorithm and like accurately keep track of everyone's scientific expertise. So we could do something kind of minimal like you're suggesting, but I think at the end of the day, we want to like be able to have the upvotes be influenced by people's like real life knowledge. So that way, instead of like one problem that Reddit has, I think is Reddit science, uh, the most upvoted papers are kind of like, they appeal to the most people. Like they're either about how like, like weed can help cure depression or like llama antibodies, you know, are good at treating COVID. Like they're kind of like jokey stuff that like, is is relatable to everyone and we think we'd get a like more scientific feed if basically experts um are able to influence their feed within their own hubs nick you had a comment can you do a quick one before we move on i was i was kind of curious so um as far as the trending is if a paper is upvoted is that the same value in the trend algorithm as an upvote on a comment of that paper because when we're talking about clicks, is, is there a waiting system where if someone's reading the comments and then upvoting the comments mm -hmm. too, that that could skew it? Because it's easier to just upvote mm -hmm. from the homepage. But if you're actually going into the comments, I was just wondering if there was a waiting Yeah, that's a very good it. point because <clears throat> I'm pretty sure um, we don't take into account any upvotes on a comment and we should. So that's something that um, we're gonna fix and I agree that that should be another uh, kind of like a signal of engagement. Okay, cool. It's a great suggestion too, because we really want to emphasize discussions. We think kind of our hypothesis is that's the best way to increase weekly active contributors. So having the most discussed papers show up first in the feed is is a great suggestion. Oh, and one more thing too, do you guys take into account the RSC given to a poster? Is that probably not a, not yet. So we used to, that was like kind of the first business model that we had tried out where if you supported a paper, it would also influence the position in the feed. So in theory, like if you really liked somebody else's paper, you wanted more people to see it and comment on it, you could spend RSC in order to increase its position in the feed. Um, we, we tried this and it turned out that like a lot of the papers on the homepage were just not very good. And we're just like whatever the people who had earned the most RSC wanted. Um, so maybe this is a solution in the future when RSC is better distributed and more people can kind of like, uh, you know, compete with their RSC support. But in general, don't we don't love the idea of kind of like this advertising via tokens. We think there's a lot of downstream, you know, negative consequences. Like the the positive outcomes are a lot less likely than the potential negative outcomes, and the revenue we generate aren't totally worth it. Um, yeah, so next thing we'd like to do is talk about uh, kind of the code of conduct that we'd like to implement. Um, Anton shared a, a notion page of our mission, vision, and values, which is kind of like the top level organization of how Research Hub is put together as a company. What I'd like to go into is our paper submission guidelines and then our discussion guidelines. And so this is kind of like a living document, but the idea here is sort of what uh, Kobe mentioned earlier is how do we distinguish ourselves from other sites that are kind of like Research Hub, where if you go on like Reddit Science or like Reddit Neuroscience, how, how do we make sure that Research Hub ends up being like the forum with an academic tone, with like a, a heavily scientific tone? So I'll share my screen here and kind of what I plan on doing is just going over the submission guidelines and then examples of like 
good submissions versus you know like not ideal submissions and then same thing with discussions so if anybody has any thoughts um yeah please just let me know um so first for the submission guidelines um we want research that follows the scientific method so this is avoiding subjective content no anecdotes so like case studies opinions um so non-systematic reviews press releases uh you know which are more about like trying to garner attention for a company or policy papers. And this is like how research would end up influencing like government or like a company's kind of actions. Um, no bias or sensational headlines. So the editorial uh, title should in theory represent the content within the paper, not necessarily overstate it. This is a big issue on Reddit and I'll, I'll, I'll do a workshop on this later, but I'm pretty good at uh, wording sensational headlines that get a lot of upvotes on Reddit. And so like I intentionally do this to get upvotes and it ends up, I think, making Reddit science not as good and kind of like a marketer's haven. So we want titles to be representative of the content within a paper, um, use peer reviewed or in progress work. This is just share papers, not blogs. So preprints or papers, um, no legal content. This is to protect our own butts. So only upload like the PDFs of papers that have open access licenses. I think everybody's doing a pretty good job with this so far. So um, I don't think there are any issues. We link to paywalls um, automatically. So this isn't a problem. Um, no off -to topic content, uh, focus on accelerating the pace of scientific research. Don't engage in social or political activism. This one's a favorite of Brian from Coinbase. Um, I don't think that this is happening at all currently though. So I think the behavior on Research Hub has been uh, perfectly fine when it comes to this. Um, so just an, ex an example of like a good paper versus like a not ideal paper. So this is the one I was talking about earlier when it comes to CBD for osteoarthritic dogs. If you look at this paper on the inside, um, it has like a background, it has methods, it has results and it has clinical significance. So um, essentially a study where if you were to look at the methodology, would you be able to independently reproduce this? And are the results presented in a way that it's like reporting research results without necessarily trying to add an opinion to the statement? I know a lot of conclusions, they kind of require you to add an opinion, but the idea here is like papers that follow the standard, uh, like I guess layout of objectives or um, like abstract background methods, results, discussion and then conclusion if it has this. Um, so looking at a post that might not qualify, um, in cryptocurrency, we've had a couple posts that are like links to outside blogs where it's essentially like an opinion on the blog and uh, the research hub post is being used as a place to kind of jumpstart a conversation. And so like, I think everybody here sees the difference between uh, like a standard scientific article and like a link to a blog. So in theory, we would want editors to help remove content like this in order to like focus the hub on more scientific papers. I know there are like cryptocurrency journals, like there's one called Ledger. Um, there's actually one in Frontiers in too. So we would prefer to have people be posting like actual scientific papers or systematic review papers, meta-analyses, that kind of thing. Um, does anybody have any questions about the paper submission guidelines before we move on to discussion guidelines? Yeah, we have a hand from Ricardo and Olga. Cool. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be really quick. Just for the, the upload paper, um, like that, that are not under licenses, do you have any like specific trick to like kind of like detect which ones are under? Because like I know most of the journals that are open access and not, but like I try to do it like with incognito or like uh, guest mode and so on, but it's still like kind of like keep me logged in in my, my own university. So we can like if anyone has a trick, just put it in the Slack. So that I can see it, because some some journals sometimes have some issues that are uh, open access, even if the journal itself is not open access. Yeah, so this is actually really hard, and I think that we need to build a feature set around this eventually to automatically detect what the license is and maybe even display it on Research Hub. Well, what I do, and this is not a great solution, but I normally like actually look at the article. So I'll like pull open the PDF, and normally like on the PDF there will be like a license information. So normally it's on the front page, but sometimes it's on like uh, at the very end near like article information. Again, this is not a great solution, but on the 
paper somewhere, there's normally an indication of like what the license that it was published under is. And then um, if it's Creative Commons, it's perfect. If it uh, says like all rights reserved, then it's not perfect. Um, yeah, I'm failing miserably here because this doesn't have an example, but I'm pretty sure that all Frontiers in is published under Creative Commons and you can essentially find it on the paper. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Cool. And then we should definitely build like a some tooling around this too, because it's it's a lot to expect people to dig into the actual papers themselves. Hey guys. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Molek. <laughs> yeah, just quickly on that, like so the Creative Commons, you know, I, I, and I think I had talked with Anton earlier about this is so there is CCBY, which is like, I think the full non-restricted access, but then there is also CCBY, NCND, which is non-commercial and non-something. And I think since as editors, we some you know, we, we get paid. I, I don't know if the non-commercial like prevents us from putting it. So I had a couple articles where I just put the link to it and didn't upload it on the website. So I think we need to clarify that too um, eventually that can we do both or is it just the exact CC uh, BY? Yeah, so uh, you can do non-commercial and non-derivative. The non-derivative means that you can't add to it on your own. So like you couldn't upload it into our um, ELN and then like change part of it. Um, non-commercial refers to like marketing or like if we wanted to like actually make a product out of the information shared within it. So I think it's like questionable if we were to tweet it from the Research Hub account as like a way to actually bring people in. But if editors want to share it, it's uh, it's totally fine for people to repost that type of content around the internet. Great, thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Yep. Olga, go ahead. Yeah, I have a several comments I have. So first of all, I think what we see here falls short of code of conduct. Uh, for example, here is a code of conduct of Google, and that's how it, in my imagination, should look like. And I think uh, things like harassment, discrimination, and other things also always uh, included in, in code of conduct, and we also should, be, sh should include them in there. Uh, also, can you s go back to the... Um, previous one. Yeah, so the three things that are listed here constitute a scientific method. So that kind of feels a little bit confusing. Uh, I think if we want to follow some kind of idea about being objective without political activism, etc., etc., we should be very strict about definitions of those things, right? So we should talk about what biased means, uh, what political activism means, what engaging in political activism looks like, and what is mission and why does it contradict engagement of, in political activism? Because, for example, I have papers in my hub about uh, evidence-based policies, right? and uh, science-informed uh, policies, things like this. So for social sciences, at least, those things uh, very often go hand to hand and it's very hard to dis di disentangle them, even though it's a valid science and there is nothing you can do about it. So, so the example that I like to think of here is, can it be reproduced? So uh, for instance, like an example, um, if you looked at cannabis for depression, Right, like there could be a paper that like, like does a retrospective um, like analysis of people who have uh, smoked cannabis and their rates of depression. And in theory, like they can include their methodology. So that way um, other people would be able to also do this retrospective analysis and see if they find like the same results. Um, but then like there could also be a paper saying like, hey, the United States needs to reschedule cannabis from like a, you know, schedule one uh, drug um, because of these downstream effects. So in theory, we want the paper that's about how cannabis influences depression. 
but we don't want the paper that's about how uh, laws should be changed um, with cannabis legalization. One thing you could do is look at, like, I know there's some papers that look at, like, um, like when Colorado uh, made uh, cannabis, like, criminalized, like, their, like, drunk driving accidents went down. So that's something where it's like, hey, it's not a policy recommendation, but they have a distinct methodology that they use to look at the effect of a policy decision. And like somebody else could in theory replicate that analysis. And so that would be okay. So basically if there's a method section where um, someone else would be able to reproduce that method section and then either replicate or not replicate the results, that's what we wanna focus on initially. Um, the idea here is that we want to stay as close as possible to discussing like the actual science behind papers and not talking about like kind of like the bigger picture effects that happen because of like some of this knowledge that's shared. Um, does that make sense? I think there is a, a future where we kind of like expand the scope of Research Hub, but this is like uh, kind of to help set a tone and culture of like actually discussing uh, reproducible science and like the findings within a reproducible science paper. It is, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And that's why it's worrisome <laughs> because, uh, so what do we do? What, what do we do with the, uh, review papers? They don't have a methodology section. What do we do with, uh, non empirical sciences, theoretical physics, math? Yeah. So our, our idea here is that we wouldn't want like narrative review papers systematic reviews are better and meta-analyses are better. Um, theoretical papers around like physics and math, we don't really have that much content being shared in those fields at the moment. So we would prefer to focus on like non-theoretical subjects um, just for this like kind of initial stages while we build up like our community and try and get the product market fit. Um, I think that th there's a lot that could be talked about here. So maybe we can think about it a little bit more and like have more discussion um, next week, just in the interest of time, because we got to move on to the discussion sections. So this is a little bit closer to what you were thinking, Olga, where it says, hey, don't be mean, like, you know, respect everybody. Um, we had a contributor's covenant uh, also here somewhere. So I will add that back. But um, the idea with discussion guidelines is we want to focus on discussing papers. So um, essentially, the discussion should be about what's presented in the paper and a little bit less about like um, tangential uh, things that relate to it. So for example, here's a really good example. Sorry, clicked on the wrong one. Um, that Nick shared. He posted a paper that's you know pretty scientific, falls into the... Um, you know, uh, reproducible science uh, format that we just talked about, and then included like a great description of what's happening in the paper. And then there was discussion around like the actual details of the content in the paper. So this is ideally what we're looking for, like discussion around uh, the content of the paper itself. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions here? So, so it seems like the ideal paper would be a typical STEM paper that doesn't have or doesn't have a need to for ecological validity. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. T typical STEM papers that doesn't have a need for ecological validity. So oh we God. don't discuss. So there is no need to discuss real world implications like in social science. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's a fair, uh, like, interpretation of what we want to go for initially. So social science hubs, just not great, <laughs> and we shouldn't have them. Well, I think there's actually, like, really good use of, like, discussing the methodology used within a social science paper to say, like, hey, do the results actually, um, like, support the conclusions that the authors claim at the end. I think there's there's a lot that can be done when it comes to like actually talking about the Yes. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I would say ecological validity and real world applications are one of them. Two of them. I, I think there's there's a world where we get there eventually, but this is what we want to start off with initially in order to help distinguish ourselves from like Reddit science, where if you look at the comments on Reddit science, a lot of it is mostly like kind of the the real world implications of the paper being discussed, not really the paper itself. 
And so we think that this is a good way to help basically make us be the leading scientific forum for discussing papers. And we will, we will talk more about the examples next time too, right? So th there could be definitely scenarios where the papers are, like they have strict methodology and they, they replicate very well. So for example, like even in our department, one of the professors studies the uh, perception of pain, right? So the perception of pain can be different across races. So what, ha what comes from that is that if you're interviewing a patient from a different race, you could underestimate their pain level and you can prescribe systematically less uh, you know, painkillers or something like that. So that obviously, that's really close to political, right? So, and the topic uh, itself can be like high octane. So uh, like I also understand the desire to like stay away from this topic just in case. I think ideally we will develop like the, the good balance, right? Yeah, for sure. And this this is something where we're going to grow over time. So we think it's uh, better for the health of research hub to grow in a more like discussing papers kind of fashion. And this could you know change in the future. But this is also an assumption on our part. And if it doesn't work, like we're open to expanding this. Um, this is just kind of to distinguish ourselves from the other forums that exist for this type of content. Cool. So we're about 15 minutes over now. Um, does anybody have any like final thoughts or comments um, until next week? Uh, just a couple of questions for Kobe. Is Kobe still online? No, I think he's he just Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, to know if the bug was uh, fixed, like the one on paper uploads, because like the paper. Oh, okay. Here it is. Kobe? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. The, is the, the, the paper upload uh, bug fixed? Like the one the paper was, was were basically uh, disappearing? Like I published a couple of papers and they disappeared from the... The from feed? The feed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was... So there is the issue of like when you upload the paper, it takes about like an hour for it to show up in the feed. Are you saying, Ricardo, that it's still not the case? It just doesn't show up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just able to retrieve it when searching for it uh, through mm. a through a comment. A comment on it, yeah. Yeah, can you send me, uh, I'm not sure, sorry if you did already, but can you sh share with me the paper sure. and the yeah. hub? And I'll look into it. Uh, I'm working on that anyway, so I'll, you know, try to fix it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Nick, before we jump off. Yeah, uh, just a quick word. I, I've been uh, trying to track, because it's sort of difficult to see uh, how upvotes relate to uh, the amount of RSC we have, so and which papers we, we got it from. Uh, I noticed some delays in getting RSC from upvotes from some papers and it's it's hard to track uh when they come in uh so i was wondering uh if perhaps i could i could put it on on github and um we could open source it but if if that could be checked uh or or tested yeah i think uh <clears throat> one I, one of the things we've been talking about internally is just uh creating like an audit trail of like how exactly you earned RSC to give you more visibility into how RSC is generated because there is there is a bit of a delay right now. Uh, you might have experienced an additional delay recently because our one of our things was down uh, the past 24 hours, which caused additional delay. But to mitigate the, these concerns. Uh, we're looking into it and it might be a good open source candidate. I do agree. Cool. Uh, one more thing. So I, I just tried to uh, send some R RSC to my wallet. I'm still seeing the 5,000 prompt so I could see the 100 uh, fee, but uh, I still get the 5,000 prompt. Okay, so you're saying that the fee has changed, but the, the 5,000 minimum withdrawal has not yet? That's right. Okay, cool. I, will... I think the limit oh, once per 10 day also is still there. 
Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for giving that feedback. I'll ping Pat Lou and hopefully get that fixed later today. So, so that way, uh, I, I think we plan on having a DAO vote later in the week. Um, we'll make sure that everybody has plenty of time in order to withdraw and then participate in that DAO vote. Cool. Yeah, well, thanks again for everybody's time and for staying for so long. This has been super productive. Uh, yeah, if you have any thoughts on the hot score or the peer review feature, uh, feel free to post them in the GitHub discussion, and we'll use kind of that discussion to lead our conversation next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. See you all later. Bye. Bye, everyone.